For about 10 presses. <laughs> okay, well, uh, hello everyone. And um, I want to discuss two papers by Joy Christian today. Uh, the first of these is called Dr. Bertelman Socks in a Quartonian World of Ambidextral Reality and was published in uh, IEEE Access last year. And the second paper, have the next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, is called uh, Quantum Correlations Are Weaved by the Spinners of the Euclidean Primitives. And this was published in Royal Society of Open Science uh, in 2018. Next slide. So um, both these papers concern Bell's theorem, and they discuss the correlations predicted uh, by quantum mechanics between widely separated spin measurements on a pair of spin half burnings. You've heard about, about this already. Uh, this is the basic uh, setup for uh, Bell's theorem. You have a source which can produce particles in a rotationally symmetric uh, singlet state, and these come out and Unfortunately, this diagram uh, is missed out the very long distance that's meant to occur between the source and the stern uh, apparatuses, which are going to analyze their spin directions. And these are being run by people at, uh, one uh, imagines, at causally disjoint distances from the central source. And they each measure the direction of spin that they find for the, uh, the particle that reaches them. And Bell's theorem is that the quantum mechanical predictions violate the predictions that would be obtained if you had a local realistic hidden variable theory uh, to uh, use instead of quantum mechanics. And yeah, next slide. Okay. So far, actual measurements support the quantum mechanical predictions. So in this sense, Bell's theorem, you can interpret it ruling out local realistic hidden variable theories for quantum phenomena, okay, because it sets bounds on what we get with such theories, and these bounds are exceeded experimentally. And this therefore goes strongly against what Einstein was hoping for when he proposed the famous EPR thought experiment in 1935. And this was the same idea, but for position and momentum measurements rather than spin. It was David Bohm and eventually uh, John Bell who turned this into an experiment with spin. Now, geometric algebra is quite good at providing a framework in which to do the multi-particle calculations necessary for quantum mechanical predictions. And since um, this is you know, in a geometric algebra context, I'll just give you a little idea about uh, how the uh, geometric algebra can be used uh, to do this. And so the, the essential component, as far as um, uh, I believe that uh, geometric algebra could be useful here is in the multi-particle space-time algebra, in which you have one copy of the STA vectors, the gamma mu's, which you've heard about several times uh, per particle. And these inhabit a larger, genuinely Clifford algebra, in which all the basis vectors are to commute. So if you've got the gamma mu's for two different particles here, then they'll commute, uh, all four of them for each particle commute with the others. Next slide. Now, you might be surprised that we've introduced the full multi-particle STA in discussion of Bell's theorem, because of course that's set in a non-relativistic context. But the next step is revealing. We define the multi-particle STA by vectors like this. We have new versions of these Pauli uh, uh, vectors, which are really by vectors in the space-time algebra. And we have one per particle uh, group, uh, defined by gamma i a, gamma naught a, where a labels the particles. And because they're made of two uh, gamma uh, basis vectors, then these Pauli basis vectors uh, from each of the different particle spaces, they mutually commute because they're bi vectors overall. And so you, straight away, you've given yourself a tensor product space from which to build up the multi-particle uh, wave functions. 
Now, if you do this, you find that it's um, in two particle case twice as large as you would want. And of course, what's happening there is you haven't taken account of the effects of the commutative scalar imaginary of ordinary quantum mechanics. And you incorporate that here uh, via needing a correlator which sits to the right of each wave function. This correlator is, uh, we call it big E, and it's one half, one minus I sigma three one, I sigma three two. And that's, as I say, that's at the right of each uh, wave function. That one worked. <laughs> no, it's you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, so that means that the eyes for the individual particles, that little eye there, tend to represent the commutative scalar eye of quantum mechanics, all have the same effect on the state. It correlates their action. Now, I don't have time to go through the details here, but it is spelled out in section 9.3.3 uh, in the Duran and Lazenby Geometric Algebra for Physicists book, where we do apply this to the singlet state and uh, to Bell's theorem. Uh, but just an outline, okay? This is what the singlet state looks like that you prepare your two electrons, say, uh, at the source. It's uh, one over root two, I sigma two, one minus I sigma two, two times its correlator. And now suppose we want to do what uh, happens in Bell's theorem. We want to construct a joint measurement to spin on the state, and this is fully rotationally uh, symmetric. And you can model this as the overlap probability between this state, epsilon, and a completely separable state, which is written here, where you've got definite directions uh, for the spin for each particle individually. And so that's given by rotor in one space, R, rotor in the second space, S, followed by E, and R and S are the rotors which take the spin directions, these I sigma threes, and rotate them to vectors P and Q. So that is a separable state, which is representing objects with directions, spin directions, P and Q. Next uh, slide. And using this, you find that the overlap probability between the states um, is uh, given by this expression here. This first line is not uh, what happens generally. There's another term in the general case, but you find you only get this term when one of these states is rotationally symmetric, which is the case for the singlet state. And it's quite pretty in that what you find you do is you sandwich this E, the correlator, between the states and their reverses. And then you multiply them together, that's the overlap, and you take the scale apart. So it's quite a neat way of being able to uh, basically do all the computations you need for uh, getting the uh, output probability here. Uh, I won't go through this, but what it boils down to is you get the probability of this overlap is one quarter, one minus cos theta. Theta is the angle between the spin by vectors P and Q. And those of you who know Bell's theorem know that the expected correlation is indeed minus cos theta. If you take off that mean, uh, that's what you get. So Bell's theorem, given this, it says, and I'm stating it here in just an intuitive fashion, uh, it's impossible to reproduce the statistics embodied in this equation if we assume that the individual particles have a well-defined spin state uh, that they're in prior to the measurement, okay? That's the key uh, thing that Bell is saying. Uh, based on this probability law. Next slide, please. So Joy Christian believes, however, that by using the geometric algebra of either 3D or 4D at Euclidean space, which carry out the computations, then to give a quote from the Royal Society paper, the resulting geometrical framework thus overcomes Bell's theorem by producing a strictly deterministic and realistic framework that allows a locally causal understanding of all quantum correlations. Now, today, I don't want to go into further aspects of Bell's theorem itself, or indeed further ways in which GA may be useful. Um, what I've given you here is just a way to get the prediction of it. Uh, I think there could be some really useful things that GA could do uh, further on, in particular in a relativistic context, which I believe will be essential for you know, finally understanding of what's going on here. But what I want to do instead here is look at the mathematics of the early part of each of these two papers I mentioned and demonstrate some problems, which certainly in the case of the first paper, you remember that's called Bergman's uh, Salt <laughs> paper, um, 
it makes conclusions about Bell's theorem very dubious. And for the Royal Society paper, uh, I suggest the proposed mathematical results are erroneous, but it's less clear what the implications would be for the subsequent work in that paper. Next slide, please. So, Bertelmann Sox, this is the gentleman himself. Uh, he was a colleague of uh, Bell's at CERN. And uh, to quote Wikipedia, in 1978, Bertelmann went to CERN where he worked together with Bell. Bertelmann always wore socks of different colors. And in 1981, Bell wrote the article Bertelmann Socks and the Nature of Reality, where he compared the EPR paradox with Bertelmann Socks. And the point was, if you observe one sock to be pink, you can predict with certainty that the other sock is not pink. And this is Bertelmann in later life, actually showing the socks and demonstrating he can still keep it up then. So Bell uh, said, you might assume that quantum entanglement is just the same as this business of, okay, one sock's pink, therefore the other one isn't. However, this is a non-admissible simplification and Bell in his article explains why. Next slide. Now, John Christian claims in his IEEE paper that within a real world of three-dimensional quaternionic sphere S3, resulting from the addition of a single point R3 infinity, then in this world, which happens to be the spatial part of the solution of Einstein's field equations of general relativity, the singlet correlations between a pair of entangled fermions be, can be understood as classically as those between Dr. Bertelmann's colorful socks. Now, this is a very big claim. If true, this would be of fundamental importance of uh, current physics. Uh, but I believe that there's a problem with the equations at a crucial point in this paper. It's slightly complex to explain. And this part of the paper was revised several times in the refereeing process. Um, but I think I can give a broad brush explanation of the problem uh, just relying on the equations in the final version. Next slide, please. So these are the details. So uh, Joy Christian wants to spin angular momentum of particles to be represented using a 3D pi vector basis, L sub i of lambda i equals one, two, three, where the lambda expresses the orientation of this basis relative to a similar detected pi detector pi vector basis d i. Okay, so we've got two pi vector bases, d sub i and l i lambda. This l i sub lambda are meant to satisfy, this is an equation from the final uh, paper, uh, l i l j is minus delta i j minus the sum over k of epsilon i j k l k. This epsilon i j k is just a standard uh, 3D permutation tensor that you're all uh, familiar with. And there's a similar equation for the d i, is equation 31. In the setup that he's envisaging, the relative handedness lambda between the particle basis uh, and the detector basis is a random variable <coughs> with values plus or minus one. Now, saying that lambda has equal probabilities for these two values, then apparently leads <coughs> ultimately to the correlations that detector outcomes for the two remote observers to be of the form he wants. And he says this reproduces the strong correlations of quantum mechanics, but with the underlying correlations being just the classical ones of the Bertel and Socks type. Now, here's an explanation of what I think is wrong uh, with the starting uh, point of this, the two equations that we've drawn attention to. And I've also relied on two further papers from Joy Christian, uh, an earlier one in IEEE from 2019, and uh, a further one from 2015, uh, that was in the International Journal of Theoretical Physics. Right? They added a few more details. Uh, next slide. So here's the problem. Let EI, I equals one, two, three, be an awful, also normal basis of the vectors of the ordinary Clifford algebra uh, CL30. And also normal simply means EI, EJ as delta IJ. There's no particular implication of any handedness uh, for the set of EI at the moment. Now let's define a pseudo-scalar for that space as i is equals one, e1, e2, e3, and define a set of all y vectors from that as follows, bi is i, e i. That's very standard. Now, given those definitions, there is no doubt that the bi satisfy uh, the relations that were written down 
uh, earlier. BIBJ is this thing uh, with the sum. We'll call that equation one. And we now discuss orientations. We're going to call the set B1, B2, B3 uh, right-handed. The right here has no absolute meaning, just wants an initial label uh, to start from. Now let BI dashed be any orthonormal basis of vectors, sorry, by vectors, which is left-handed compared to the BI basis. So for example, we could reach such a basis for an odd number of sign changes compared to the original basis, or you can make an odd number of swaps in order. Now, given these definitions, it follows that BI dashed BJ dashed is minus delta IJ. Now there's a plus sign here before the sigma K. That's the line JK, BK dashed. And we call that form of the relation equation two, right? There's now a plus sign in this position where there was a minus sign before. And I have to say, we are taking epsilon line JK to have a fixed definition in terms of permutations line JK. It just has this uh, perfectly normal meaning. We'd have to redefine the symbol to avoid this. Um, so uh, should just say Joy Christian goes on to turn these into uh, relations involving um, uh, sums over vector components, uh, i, j, and k, with this here. And you end up, of course, with a cross product, and then you worry, well, is the definition of cross product changing? Uh, I, in communication with Joy Christian, he's made it clear, no, there's no change in the definition. And I think it's perfectly safe to just go with this epsilon i, j, k, being fixed things that we'd all know immediately that it was. Okay, next slide, please. Now, as an example of how we end up with a plus sign there, um, you can consider the change in orientation induced by taking bi dashed is just minus br, right? That's a very simple thing to do. That will flip the orientation because there's three of them. And if we go back, and I do want to go back to equation one here. Thank you, that's fine. So if we go back here, you can see if I flip each of the Bs, then I get no sign change on this side, uh, but I do get a sign change just here because there's only one B. And that's how you end up with a plus just there. Okay, thank you. So you can visually see uh, that uh, the equation will end up uh, as I've said. So you can, we can summarize this by saying that if a bivector base is set bi dashed has an orientation lambda, where lambda equals plus one means the same orientation, lambda equals minus one means the opposite orientation, then it will satisfy this modified equation here, where you can take care of both cases by having a lambda outside. Of course, when that's minus one, you end up with a plus one here. Next slide. So these preliminaries concern the general basis. Let's see what um, Joy Christian says about his specific objects. And he says that as concerning the detector by vector algebra, the Ds, you should start with the basis EI, define this thing we've just been talking about, and DI is I E I. So this has exactly the same algebraic properties as BI. Since you didn't specify, we didn't specify anything about the handle of this, or otherwise the EI. Okay? Other than being also normal, they were left general, and in particular, uh, the Ds will satisfy this equation here with a minus. Now let's go to the spin by vector algebra. Here we have a new set of vectors, the I dashed. From these, we define a new pseudo scalar like this. Let's call it J. Next slide. And then the Li are formed from that. And we get Li is J E I dashed. And of course, the same straightforward calculation has led to the equation three for the Di now leads to this for the Ella. So all this is in agreement with the equations of the paper, no problem with that. And there's apparently no lambda that you need just here. This is all fine, except of course we're now in trouble. We've already established that left-handed bivector bases should satisfy equations of the form two rather than one. But if you remember those, I won't go back to those. So this means that like the DI, the set Li here is automatically right-handed. Okay, next slide. And how this has happened is because the construction in terms of first creating a pseudoscalar via product 
in ascending order of the three basis vectors, followed by putting the ith basis vector on the right of the pseudoscalar, is automatically right handed, which is perhaps slightly a surprising feature uh, of um, the process. Uh, the nature of the handedness of the original vectors is irrelevant. Imagine if you flipped the sign of all of these to change their orientation, that will flip the sign of the pseudoscalar, and so you end up with the same y vector basis in each case. So the relative orientation between the spin by vector and detector by vector sets is in fact always fixed to lambda equals plus one, which is probably fatal for the rest of the paper, because that wanted to envisage a case where the lambda flipped randomly between plus and minus one. Uh, next slide. And we can see in an independent way that we've got problems, since if we do write in line with equation 32 in the uh, Joy Christian paper, the Li for lambda equals minus one is indeed minus d i, then it's completely clear you've got a flip set of phi vectors. And so if the di satisfy uh, three, then the Li have to satisfy this with plus in front. And this is effectively independent of the above arguments concerning the basis vector sets, the i and the i dash, uh, and how we set those up. So you're left with either needing to introduce a lambda on the right-hand side of the relevant equations, or agreeing that lambda is always plus one. I think either of these mean that the arguments of the rest of the paper that's by the current form. Now, uh, Richard Gill, I think is uh, online as well, um, he wrote a comment about the Bertrand and Sox paper, which was published in IEEE. Uh, he draws attention to the same equations. So at that point, he suggests uh, patching them up in terms of all the definitions of the cross product, um, uh, but then went on to look at several other problems that are contained in the paper. Uh, I put here what I believe is the intrinsic problem with those equations themselves and um, how you're left with uh, the lambda basically all to be uh, plus one. Okay, so next slide. And what we're looking at now is the other paper that I mentioned, and that was called Quantum Correlations are Weaved by the Spinners of the Euclidean uh, Primitives. Now, I won't spend as much time on this because I've already uh, written something down uh, in, sorry, now it's working, I think. Yeah. Oh, well, I gave it to you. <laughs> no? No, I gave you up. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's see. Uh, so I discuss some of the mathematical problems in this paper, a 1D up approach to conformal geometric algebra applications of line fitting in quantum mechanics. The point here is in this one, Joy Christian is working with the 4D uh, Clifford algebra of Euclidean uh, space, okay? And so that fits in with a particular 1D up approach, uh, which I've uh, been working with. So that's why I was looking at what he'd done. And I only want to draw out one main issue here, which seems to be the dominant one. And this concerns the mathematical claims in section two of the Joy Christian paper to have found an associative version of the eight dimensional Octonian norm to division algebra. And the claim to have done this. I'll just read that more slowly. An associative version of the eight dimensional Octonian norm division algebra seems to be important uh, in the development of the paper. This actually was also written up separately in the paper Eight Dimensional Octonian Light and Associative Norm Division Algebra in this preprint here, which was then published in Communications and Algebra in 2020. And actually, since then, the editors of Communications and Algebra have retracted the article. And so if you look for it online, this is now the reference, uh, which is 2021, and that points to the retracted version. So the essence of the problem, and this has also been re repeatedly pointed out by Richard Gill, is that Joy Christian claims that the spinners of CL40, i.e. the Clifford Algebra 4D Euclidean space, can be equipped with a norm such that if x and y any two spinners, by which we mean general even elements, then the norm of the product x and y is the norm of x times the norm of y. I norm of the product is the product of the norms. And note the product in here is just the standard Clifford associative uh, product. And then coupled with the requirement that every non-zero element has a non-zero positive scalar as its norm, 
then this is the hallmark of a normed uh, division algebra. So famously, uh, Hurwitz's theorem, it was published posthumously in 1923, was known about earlier in various forms. It says that the only such algebras are the real numbers, complex numbers, quaternions, noctonians, and the latter, of course, non-associative. Now we've highlighted that the product that Joy Christian is using is associative. So his claim runs in contradiction to Hurwitz's theorem. And that's why the uh, editors of Communications and Algebra would be fairly certain that it was correct to retract the paper. Um, now, let's see if we can understand what's happened. So it's clear from equation 2.8 in this paper that by norm of a general even multi vector M, he means this. He means the square root of the scalar part of M, M reverse. And we can see that this square root is valid and won't lead to imaginaries as follows. So let's set up a general M by defining two, two spinners, phi and chi. These are just in these are the Pauli spinners and the uh, space time algebra. And we're going to have phi is uh, this combination, chi is this combination. These are just basically the sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. And we write M, the general even element, as phi plus i chi. I is the pseudoscalar for the 4D Euclidean space. Now, in uh, Euclidean uh, 4D space, I squared is plus one. And when you work out what M, M reverse comes to, you get this here, you get a scalar part of phi pi reverse plus chi chi reverse, and and pseudo scalar part given by this. Now, it's a bit hard to see what's going on here and what signs will emerge from this. So I'm going to define two four vectors using the components of phi and chi, right? I, I call them A and B for obvious reasons. I'm not saying uh, that the phi or chi are four vectors, we're just defining objects that make it just easy to display the components of M and reverse. So I group things together like that with an A naught and a B naught uh, at the beginning. And what you find is that this scalar part of M, M reverse is A squared plus B squared, which in Euclidean space is certainly always positive. And the other part, the imagined, not the imaginary, the pseudo scalar bit is to A dot B, as I've written here. So this shows us that the scalar part of M, M reverse a squared plus b squared is indeed positive uh, if m is not zero. And so this norm we've talked about is indeed well defined. So that, that's all okay. Now let's get to the claim about the product of the norms. And this is made in Christian's equation 240. And just to remind you, let's just go back. That was here. The product, normal product, is a product of the norms. Now there's unfortunately an explicit counterexample to this. And consider the quantities i plus, which is one half, one plus i, right? i is the 4D scalar, i minus is one half, one minus i. And since i squares to one in its own reverse, then these it turns out are idempotents, and they satisfy these relations. i plus squared is i plus, i minus squared is i minus, and they annihilate mutually. And this particular pair are orthogonal since their product is zero. Now, from these, let's define x is square root of 2 pi plus, y is square root of 2 pi minus. Then, what you find is that norm of x is 1, norm of y is 1, but fatally, the norm of x, y is zero. Okay, so that's that. Uh, the theorem that the uh, product of the norms of the normal products uh, fails. So, that uh, disposes of that assertion, but it also means that the assertion which follows it, which says one of the most important observations here is that without loss of generality, we can restrict our representation space to a set of unit vectors. That's false. The assertion we've just seen, if x and y are unit vectors, it does not follow that their product is also a unit vector. Now, there's a lot more we can say on this, and in particular, seeking to understand my dry Christian thinks that the above counterexample for the product from x to y is inadmissible because he does think it's inadmissible. But it all boils down to this problem that somehow he thinks he can set this 4D 
um, pseudoscalar part of the product, pi chi reverse plus chi pi reverse, or equivalently to a dot b pi, uh, arising the great whole part of that. He thinks he can set that to zero without loss of generality as regards m. But of course, we can't. It's only special m's that satisfy that. That part of m only vanishes if, in GA terms, n is a scale rotor. I satisfies n is rho r, where r is a genuine rotor satisfying r r reverses one, and rho is a non zero scalar. So, since he, in fact, restricts the unit x anyway, we can summarize the entire mathematical development of section two of the Rolls of paper uh, once we strip out this false claim about the norm division algebra as follows. If R is a rotor and S is another rotor, then the combination SR is a further rotor, since it satisfies this straightforward relation here, which is fine and does follow. Okay? So, if what I just said about composition of rotors in 4D is enough to underpin the mathematical needs of the remainder of the paper as it concerns Bell's theorem, then the fact that this is the content for the first part of the paper is not necessarily fatal. One would certainly like to see how the rest of the paper goes, however, to it using just this as its mathematical basis. And it is necessary to say that none of this is brought down or stated in the Rosa Society paper itself. There it categorically states this norm relation applies to all the even subalgebra of CL40. If that was true, it would make it a genuine norm division algebra, but of course. We see A that that's mistaken and B that it's impossible so it violates the Herbert's theorem. Um, as a final point, this is just a, an advert, uh, I've been looking at how one would actually go about understanding octonians within uh, geometric algebra and have what I think is a new approach, which works with a non associative product, of course, it has to, but wholly within the space time algebra. And I'll talk about that on Thursday. Okay, thanks. Right, uh, time for questions. Yes. Uh, perhaps we can ask the guys on the previous day. Certainly, there are guys with us. Not in, in the May, um, if I may, may make uh, one comment, um, so, I, I like that uh, talk very much. Um, um, I just wanted to comment that in the right in the beginning. Anthony, you said uh, we measure the spin directions of the two spins, but that's a little bit misleading terminology because one does not measure the spin directions of the two spins. One looks at the spins in some directions and one gets an answer yes or no, which is a very essential part of the whole uh, story. And, that, and, you, and you skipped it. I, I mean, it's not, it wasn't relevant to your story, but I think it's important to uh, say that this is a very important feature of Bell's theorem. Yeah, that, that's fine. Of course, I completely agree. Um, what I was trying to talk about was how you compute that overlap integral between a completely separable state, which does have definite spins in, and the singlet state, which they're actually prepared in. So I was describing that rather than talking about the measurement outcome, which I fully agree is, is a binary one in, in the Bell's theorem. Yeah, OK. Um, Anthony, and Joy, Joy Christian uh, claimed that when um, you said flip in the in the sphere uh, of the quaternion, before you get uh, up the, the orientation spin uh, left hand. So, and this is a result of this lambda you explained that should remain plus lambda, right? But or even appears minus, and then if, if they change the cross product and it becomes like a bit uh, auto product, but in the left hand, does this correct this point? Right. So 
Um, I think Joy Christian was setting, this is in the version of the Sox paper, the experiment in, uh, in S3 rather than R3, in order that you could have potentially different orientations after traveling around the complete sphere. Okay? I think that's why he was doing that. But what I'm talking about is the algebra of the interaction between the detector and whatever state the um, incoming particle is in. And in that context, I believe everything I've written is completely correct and is just talking about the local interaction between those two and the relative handedness of those two. Right. And that the equations he's written being that the relative handedness is always plus one. And I think that's independent of any questions about how you would actually get this flipping between the different states. Storage of the noise trap. Yes, he, he was, that's right. Of course, he was doing uh, setting it up to be analogous to a Mobius sure. fan. But still, you have to consider well, what am I doing? If I'm interacting with the detector and the spin of the particle at that point, and you have to right. then be cl very clear about your equations to make sure there aren't traps in orientation, and that's why I was being clear there and showing because of the structure of the equations, they end up with the same orientation. Okay, yes, thank you for that. Is there any other comments? Right, let us thank to Anthony. <laughs> Thank you.